So what is a container? Essentially, if you break it down to kind of some of its rawest forms, right? A container, what a container actually is, it really just consists of a few kind of disparate things that are brought together into the container concept. So we have a root file system. There's, there's a, a file system programs and stuff like that that are, that are set up somewhere that we need to, we need to set up and mount into like our, our mount namespaces and stuff like that. And that kind of leads us into uh, another aspect of containers. So, so containers really are kind of like a collection of a few different things as I alluded to. And one of those things is namespaces. And if you're not familiar with namespaces in Linux, it's a concept that allows you to kind of slice up different resources on, on the system. So like you can have a, a PID namespace uh, so that you can, you can be PID1 in, in that namespace um, and then have a, a separate PID within the, the global PID namespace. Um, you can have mount namespaces, things like that. So it's, it's really just a way to provide a little bit of isolation to the processes running within this container so that they can't really, they, they, they get like a, a sliced view of the, of the overall system. Another, uh, one of the other disparate kind of things that, that comes together to make what, what is an actual container is uh, C groups, so control groups. So where, where namespaces kind of slice up uh, um, kind of like kernel resources like PIDs and, and the file system and things like that, um, control groups slice up more like hardware resources. So you can set like um, memory limits, um, CPU share limits, things, things like that. Um, there's also, uh, so with cgroups v2, there's different controllers and things like that. So um, there's, there's also like perf events controllers and stuff like that. So you, you get access to um, perf events that come from your CPU. That's really important when you're trying to like profile something that's running within a, uh, a, a C group or namespace. So now we have the, the root file system. We have a set of namespaces that, uh, that slices up, you know, different resources, PIDs and, and things like that. And then we have control groups to slice up uh, some of the, the aspects of the hardware. So this brings together kind of a little bit of the isolation and the control that we have over, over what's running within the container. Another aspect to containers is kind of like the security aspect. So uh, processes running within a container, you know, a set of namespaces, C groups, things like that, um, inherit uh, like Linux system capabilities. So if this is a concept that you're not uh, familiar with, Linux has like this uh, concept of system capabilities where uh, the like super user powers are sliced up into different kind of distinct uh, capabilities that you can control uh, so that like you don't necessarily have to grant a process complete super user privileges. You can grant them a, a slice of those privileges just to be able to do the tasks that they actually need to do and nothing more. So it's a way of kind of constraining processes and things like that that run in your system um, and ensuring that they're not doing things that you don't expect them to do or don't want them to do. So uh, a few examples, um, CapNet Admin, uh, this capability allows you to make uh, networking changes, like set different routes and, and things like that. Um, so it's pretty powerful. Capsys admin is, is a big one. Uh, so it, it's kind of like an overarching thing. Um, it gives you basically permission to do any, like run with any capability. Um, I, I know it covers most of them. I don't think it covers all of them. I, I think there's a few capabilities that sysadmin won't still grant you. Um, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure what's excluded, but the bulk of the capabilities are kind of granted to you if you're, if you're a sysadmin. There's cat BPF, so the ability to kind of load and run BPF programs into the kernel. Um, and that's another thing where if you're not familiar with it, it's really interesting. So uh, eBPF is kind of briefly like, like an interpreter that's in, that's in the kernel um, that runs in the kernel like address space. So you, you write these like these programs in C, they get uh, compiled onto eBPF bytecode, and programs can load those into the kernel to do a ton of stuff. So Delve actually uses eBPF to do tracing um, of function calls in like a way more efficient manner. It gets rid of a lot of like uh, syscall um, overhead and, and that kind of thing. 
So if you're curious about any of that kind of stuff, I, I would encourage you to learn more, but I digress. So the, this, this capability is needed to, to be able to perform any actions on like BPF programs and load them into the kernel and that kind of thing. Um, the last one that we'll talk about, so there's plenty more. Like if you look at uh, Linux capabilities, like the actual man page for them or any of the documentation, there's tons of different uh, capabilities. This is barely even scratching the surface. Um, I just wanted to give a few examples of some kind of interesting ones. The one that we'll, we'll be concerned with a little bit more today is CAPSIS ptrace. Um, if you're not familiar with what ptrace is, it's essentially a mechanism within the Linux kernel that allows one process to trace and examine another process. And it's basically the backbone of how debuggers work. Uh, so without the capability to use ptrace, or attached to another running process or any of those things, um, the, the debugger essentially can't really do its job. Um, ptrace handles everything from uh, like, you, a debugger would use ptrace to stop the process, uh, continue the process, read memory from the process, write, write into the process's um, address space, all kinds of things. Essentially the bulk of what you would, you would do with a debugger is handled by the, the ptrace uh, syscall at, at a very low level. This capability is very important and, and becomes especially important as we talk about debugging within a container um, because when, when the processes is run within the container, um, it, it inherits, so the, these, these Linux system capabilities are inherited um, from parent processes and, and things like that. So it started with a set of, with a set of capabilities that are usually pretty restrictive um, because you you typically want to like be very mindful of the security context of what's running within your containers and things like that. So this will come into play a little bit later during the demo, but I just wanted to introduce the concept a little bit. And then finally, um, you're not really doing anything interesting within a container if there's nothing running in it. Uh, so you need one or more processes running within a container. And there you go. With these kind of disparate concepts, you have the overarching concept of what a container actually is. Um, and there's, there's more that, that goes into it. This is, this is still pretty generalized, but um, I wanted to give everybody kind of an idea of like, from a broken down deconstructed aspects, what really is this thing that, is, that we call a container and, and what, what makes it so difficult to, to debug in in the first place. So hopefully this gives everybody a pretty good understanding. Thank you.